drawing of a Navajo medicine lodge. And you can see it's a elongated form of the Hogan. And is remarkably like the peak of a mountain from a distance. In the woodlands of what has become the United States and uh, southern Canada, the central medicine lodge, the Mediwewen, was open. And one had a um, fenced corral of evergreens. And there were bare print paths that went into the floor area of the Mediwewen Lodge. And one would go along this uh, bare print path looking for cure to reinstate uh, health, to bring the medicine into play, all under the uh, openness of the uh, stars. And when one would get to the end of the floor pattern with its steps and its uh, chants and its um, articulate intervals, one would then find a vertical complement to the floor plan. And generally, the vertical would be uh, around a pole. And the pole would be ritually tailored so that its uh, shape, its colors, its uh, segmentation formed a right angle to the floor plan. And so you would get this uh, right angle of the ritual calibration of retuning ourselves to the world. All of this under the stars. The enclosed quality was always like a sweat lodge, where like the hundred willow sweat lodge of the willow saplings being woven almost as if it were a very large uh, basket. And in that sweat lodge, there would be a cutout in the center of it where the very hot stones that would be heated outside would be brought along a special path. And that uh, fire that heated those stones would be made on top of the excavated earth brought out into a small mound, and then the stones heated there and brought in down that path. And then on the hot stones, the water and the sweet grass uh, would be placed, and you would get the steam, and you would get the herbal healing uh, mist. But for the uh, Navajo, very often with their uh, medicine lodges, the healing uh, takes place within this uh, kind of a modified hogan, this uh, medicine lodge. So there are different versions of a very familiar array. And the northern woodlands that uh, Medi we win is of going back to a very um, recent, more recent primordiality than uh, the idea of an encased uh, structure. The underground kiva, the enclosed structure is uh, much uh, later. The more primordial was always open under the stars. One of the earliest ritual comportments to bring a ceremonial cycle of healing through a great complexity into its uh, whole goes back uh, to Paleolithic times. And we can see 
in some of the earliest Paleolithic caves with cave art. Uh, Cusquer, uh, Chauvet, which go back almost 40,000 years, there is a choreographic uh, initiatory path that goes through the caves and uh, brings one back into wholeness, back into participation with nature. The earliest written way of expressing that cycle is a thought word indeed. And that earliest expression in that tripartite terminology comes from the original uh, Gathas of Zarathustra about 4,000 years ago. Thought, word, and deed. Thought is uh, the symbols, word is the uh, mythic, and deed is the ritual. So that our learning, our educational cycle, is a very traditional ancient wisdom. We have reversed it because we're learning it, and so it's deed, word, and thought. And put in that way, you can see that deeds and thoughts are two objectivities that are linked by a process of language. And that that process of language has uh, an ambidextrous quality to it. It can lean forward to the symbol or it can rest firmly on the ritual. And generally, if a language goes on a ritual basis, it will develop the participation in nature so that one is absorbed by nature. If you go slightly towards a more balanced uh, quality, then the language will become mythic and one goes into experience, which then generates not your participation as a member of the tribe, in nature exclusively, but you, the development of your character, the character who undergoes the experience, who makes the uh, language. And out of this, instead of there being a ritual repetition, like a report, or like a set litany, or like a set chant, the emphasis on character inhabiting an experience, a life experience, generates uh, the sense of myth. And just a little further, when it goes slightly more towards the other way, the character who lives that experience becomes the seed for the symbolic individual. So that one moves from being a member of the tribe to someone who is uh, not conscious so much, but sentient about one's experience and develops a character, and then that character interiorizes, <coughs> excuse me, and becomes the seed of the uh, symbolic individual. And that that, as we'll see, that symbolic individual is capable of a very high order of integration, an integration to uh, what used to be called uh, completeness, and that that completeness has then a center, and that that centering in the mind, the centering of thought in its subjective pattern, releases a quality of individuality which is able to do two rare functions at once. It is able to accept the completeness and is able to be absorbed in a completely new way. And that acceptance finishes the integral and the new quality of absorption initiates the differential. And out of that differential quality comes a vision, a transforming uh, quality of consciousness. And that quality of differential consciousness that transforms goes back in two different ways at the same time. It can go back through an exchange with the mind and make the mind transformable. <laughs>
it can also go back into nature, and nature accepts visionary consciousness. And when nature accepts visionary consciousness, then the whole quality of existence becomes charmed, becomes magical. Then things are not just extant, they are glorious. <laughs> they have a splendor. So uh, one of the great classics of transformational complete literature, the Zohar, is called the Book of Splendor. That all of uh, existence now is not just existential, but it is uh, radiant. <laughs> so that one lives in a new place. In the original nature, existence was the establishment of the universe, the one place, the oneness place, the universe. And so complete was the oneness, the uni of the universe, the unity, the oneness of existence, that on every level, every calibration of the universe, it was whole. It was oneness. It was a unity. Every iteration of every subatomic particle was whole in what it was. And all of the constellation of these wholenesses added up to more complex integrals of wholeness. And the final completeness was that the universe was one, one wholeness. But when there is a differential transform that's initiated, the universe transforms into a cosmos. And a cosmos is not simply complete, but it now has a different quality that was never there in the original, and the new quality is best called perfection. So that one can have not only the complete universe, but one can have a perfect cosmos. And the perfection of the cosmos depends upon harmonics, upon harmonic sets being differentially understood to the nth degree through art and through history and through science. So there are two different ecologies that happen, but what we're looking at now, we're focusing on ritual, the way in which existence in this particular phase always initiated a sequence of uh, deed, word, and thought. Thought, word, and deed, and those three. And so the big concern here is that the universe's wholeness accept us and that we participate in it. And what throws us out of the integral of nature, what throws us uh, into an impairment of existence, of existential crisis, is uh, the interference in that uh, link, that participation, that pattern. It can be an interference of disease. It can be an interference of, of something demonic, of something evil. Anything that throws us out of the existential participation with the way in which wholeness is, so that when wholeness is, it's in consonant with the mysterious zero infinity of nature. But when we're out of sync, then the wholeness begins to be infected on every single level, and one has to be reinstated. One has to be brought back into sync. And when we're looking at, as we are now, two different planetary sources of ritual, the Chinese Confucian and the Navajo sand painting, both these are ways in which ritual reinstates and brings back into play the thought, word, and deed based on doing the deed first through the language into uh, the thought, and all of this is brought into nature. Now the Chinese, just for a moment, here's a translation of the Li Qi done by James Leggy, 
the Book of Rites, an encyclopedia of ancient ceremonial usages, religious creeds, social institutions. And uh, this is one of the five classics of the Confucian order in China. And generally, the Chinese classics are put out in scholarly editions. This uh, edition uh, published uh, in uh, five volumes, uh, published in Taipei. Uh, and you find the Chinese text, you find the translation, you find the commentary. All of these were done in the 19th century. There are 20th century uh, versions of them. But it was the first time with people like Max Mueller and James Legge that there were the reinstatement of the entire order of the Confucian classics. The first Confucian classic, the root of that ritual comportment is in the Analects. And this is one of our books that we're taking along with the uh, Navajo medicine men paintings. The Analects are, as we said last week, collected about uh, two generations after Confucius, so that they were collected about the uh, time of the, say, 400 to 420 BC. And so the Analects, the Lun Yu, are uh, contemporaneous with the Torah reforms of Ezra and Nehemiah in uh, uh, Judaism. They're contemporary with the beginnings of the uh, Platonic, Socratic Platonic uh, dialogues. And uh, they are contiguous with a number of other developments uh, in the world. The Analects are divided into 20 books. And at the end of the first book, one finds typical, a ritual report of a dialogue. It isn't the dialogue, it's the ritual report of the dialogue to make sure that you have the rote exactness of what this dialogue is, and then you will have the rote commentarial understanding of it. And by annealing yourself to the ritual text, just like sitting on a Navajo sand painting, you will be in position to be retuned and recalibrated back to a wholeness, which then will be in sync with uh, nature. The very end of book one of the Analects, at just two or three sentences in, gives us the nib of the entire process. Zigong said, poor, but avoiding obsequiousness, rich, but avoiding arrogance, what about that? The master said, that will do, but it is not at all as good as poor, delighting in the way, rich, but loving ritual. The way, of course, Tao, and we talked last week about the interface of Confucius and Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu about two generations older. The Analects written about two generations later. So that Confucius is a fulcrum between two completely different ways in which the Chinese civilization's uh, streams run. It's a watershed. Confucius is the watershed. He is the, he is the ridge line. He is the great divide between two different ways. Lao Tzu's way is to pay attention to Tao Te, whereas the inheritors of Confucius assumed that Tao Te mysteriously takes care of itself and that what we need to concern ourselves with is Gen E. Gen being the human nature quality and the E being the symbols. So uh, Lao Tzu goes for Tao Te, Confucius is the arbiter, and after him it goes for Gen Yi. And out of this you have four phases that are four of the five phase energy cycle in Chinese civilization. Tao Te, Gen Yi, and then the fifth phase was classically called Li. 
But in the Taoist understanding, it isn't Li, it's Qi, it's Qi. So that Chinese medicine is Taoist and not Confucian. Whereas Chinese court order is Confucian and not Taoist. And one has a different comportment and uh, Confucius is like the membrane that allows for both those comportments to have, at least in his person, a balance. So Confucius is very, very valuable to understand China and the Chinese contribution to planetary uh, culture and the Chinese contribution to the coming interstellar civilization. If you tune yourself to Tao Te, then zero and one as a set are what you're concerned with, how oneness comes out of zero, how wholeness comes out of emptiness. And one of the concerns of this later on in uh, the Chinese uh, development of uh, the Taoist uh, Buddhist uh, interface in the Tang Dynasty is summarized by the later Japanese koan version of it, uh, emptiness is form and form is emptiness. The one comes whole out of zero and zero is able to manifest itself as a wholeness, as one. Whereas the Confucian inheritors look at Gen and E, they look at Gen not as zero and one, but Gen as divided as two, as paredness, sometimes as polarity, sometimes as duality, that there is a two quality to it. And the simplest way to show this is that language develops ritually as an expression from at least one to another. So that the dialogue form in the Analects is that language originally is not for individual expression. It's not for the expression of character and experience. It is for the recording and exactness of how one speaks to another, the codification of language in a ritual mode. And out of this come the forms of chants, of litanies, of laws, of codes, and it is the codification of language in ritual that makes ritual uh, language not able to express character nor experience, but to reinstate the wholeness of existence. And one of the most difficult things for us to appreciate and understand, the wholeness of ritual comportment of deeds, of action, of ritual action, and of ritual elements to establish isness in its existential wholeness is the referent for mental objectivity before it's transformed. So that integral symbols always have as their referent existentiality. And between those two objectivities, language in its mythic mode must always be recycled back into the ritual in order to establish the existential referential trustability. And so thought is always matched in a secondary way with ritual objectivity. If you go the other way, if you go the Taoist way, it isn't at all that ritual is a primordial, it's that nature's expressed mysteriousness is always permeating the uh, existentiality and so one is looking not to stop with the mind, not to stop with symbols, but to have the symbols be transparent so that the motion of mysterious nature gaining amperage with the process of 
experience, mythic experience, sentient, languaged, imaged experience, makes the form of the imagination in thought, in the mind, able to be transformed in a very special way by visionary consciousness. And so to the Taoist, the symbolic mind is a frame of transparency and not at all objective in and of itself. Its objectivity is to be a window a portal, a gate, and uh, perhaps gate is the uh, best way to talk about it. Uh, in the Tao Te Ching, there is a whole section where Lao Tzu says, of all of this that we now are able to characterize, the deepest, the most profound quality is that gates are objectively the best symbolic reality. And gates are made not to stop at, but to go through. We're looking now at Confucius and the way in which it isn't that the mind then has gates, but that the mind has the right conclusions, the right judgmental understandings and that they correlate and go back and gain their traction, their referentiality, their certainty, because the rituals have established it right. And we find uh, in the uh, Navajo universe a very, very similar thing. It's quite extraordinarily uh, similar. And one would expect that the late uh, coming of the uh, Athabascan language people like the uh, Navajo are very similar to um, the ancient Chinese that were just coming out of the long Paleolithic into uh, the Neolithic. They're, they were still hunters, but they were not uh, quite yet uh, farmers. And about 12,000 years ago, 10,000 uh, BC, when the first of the second wave were coming over, the Paleolithic wisdom was beginning to phase itself into uh, the nascent Neolithic. And while Paleolithic is about hunting, the wild game, the wild plants in nature, the Neolithic was all about taming the animals, taming the plants, taming ourselves, and instead of living exclusively in the trails of nature, one um, ordered those pathways so that one lived on the paths of tradition. And those paths of tradition were essential to taming the animals and having them then available in a controlled way, of taming the plants and having them in a controlled way and of human nature no longer being mysteriously wild, but of being also tamed, so that the tamed nature, the tamed animals, the tamed plants would form a ritual ecology of certainty, uh, but there was something that still was outside of control, and that was the occasional supernatural happening, the occasional evil happening, the occasional disease happening, the accident happening. And so a lot of the rituals in the Navajo universe are all about restoring wholeness back again once it has been impaired, once it has been lost. In very ancient uh, times, several hundreds of years ago, it is said that there were about 26 different cycles, ceremonial cycles, and only six of them survive into the modern world, and two of those in the last 50 years have be, become obsolete. The war ceremonials of the Navajo sand painting uh, ritual comportment, the last time that they were used, and it was very rare, was uh, in the beginning of World War II. 
Navajo was uh, chosen to be a special language that the United States military used because the, neither the Japanese nor the Germans were able to uh, uh, crack the code of Navajo. And one reason for this is that Navajo, Navajo had never been written down. It was not a written language. It was only a spoken language that had many different inflections and one had to learn to speak Navajo. But in order for the United States military to prepare for this and to be able to know what they were using, they had to have a codification of Navajo. And so in the 1930s already, you found the first beginnings of writing Navajo down. And our choice of Gladys Reichardt is because she was involved in this uh, whole program. She was involved in the first writing down of Navajo language. And she was one of the few people who had gone to the Navajo people with the intent to be a human being among them. And she was adopted into a family. She lived with a family. She learned to speak fluent Navajo so that she was one of the most uh, capable people of making this written Navajo blend with the kinds of linguistic cognizance that are necessary for a useful language, not just to be used as code, but to record accurately all of the anthropological ceremonies. Her main concern was not military code, but because of her education, because of her teacher, because of her confreres, they were convinced that the culture of the native peoples was going to vanish and no longer be there, and so it had to be recorded accurately. And it had to be recorded not for those people. They didn't need a written language. They had the ritual oral language. But for people who would come later who were used to reading a language, there had to be that recording of these uh, traditions, of these ceremonies. And Gladys Reichard was of a um, second generation of people who were committed to this task. The first generation were in the period of 1879 to 1880. And the reason why that is such a uh, striking year, it's a watershed year. It's like Confucius in the Chinese tradition is a watershed. In the United States, 1880 is a watershed because that was the coming of the railroads to the West. And instead of it taking months by covered wagon, in a couple of days you could traverse the continent. And not just a handful of people, 50 at a time, or 100 or 200 at a time, but tens of thousands and millions at a time. And so the American West from 1880 was suffering a sea change that was irrevocable and uh, non-stoppable. And so the United States set up in 1879 the uh, Bureau of ethnology uh, that reported that that time to the secretary of the Smithsonian uh, uh, Institution and the director was John Wesley Powell. Uh, John Wesley Powell was a Civil War uh, uh, officer who lost uh, his uh, right hand and had only his left hand and uh, he refused to um, be incapacitated. And so Powell is famous for uh, being one of the first people to raft down the Colorado River with only one hand and with his group. And he wrote a classic book on the uh, uh, rafting on the Colorado River. He was um, an inspiration for uh, individuals like John Muir and uh, Teddy Roosevelt. He was uh, not only the director of the Smithsonian Institution, but that the American Bureau of Ethnology was committed to saving the remnants of the culture of the American Indian and the central figure who came into play was actually a man from Germany, Franz Boas. And when he came in 1900 to New York City, 
to Columbia University, he set up a program in the 1890s, uh, late 1890s. His first graduate students became the original anthropologists, like Alfred Kroeber and Robert Lowy, Elsie Clues Parsons, individuals who for the first time came about 15 years into the American Bureau of Ethnology's plan to publish every year an annual. And for about half a century, they published these great, big, huge, thick, green annuals. And then they published reports, bulletins, that sometimes would run to several hundred pages. Sometimes, like I brought last week, bulletin number 40 is over 2,000 pages. Part one in 1912, part two in 1922. All of this was extraordinary because the first generation of anthropologists were largely men, and the second generation of anthropologists were overwhelmingly women. From 1920 to 1940, 20 women received PhDs in anthropology from Franz Boas at Columbia, and they became the most famous anthropologists of the century. Ruth Benedict, Margaret Mead, Gladys Reichard, Ruth Underhill, Ruth Bunzel, it goes on and on. All of the stars of mid 20th century anthropology are almost all American women. What's interesting is that among them, Gladys Reichardt was one of the few who not only learned to speak the language like a man and to understand it in every nuance, but she learned to weave like a woman. <laughs> And she could uh, weave a Navajo rug. And the weaving of a Navajo rug is an annual cycle. I once bought for my uh, daughter, because she was a, a Blackfoot Indian, the, a little children's book called Geraldine, who's a goat, a sheep, rather. And Geraldine is fed by the old Navajo woman until the nice uh, coat grows, and then it's sheared and then it's carded, and then it's uh, spun, and then it's uh, dyed, then it's woven, and by the time the blanket is finished and woven, a whole year has gone by, and Geraldine is ready to uh, have uh, the new coat uh, nourished again. So it's an annual cycle, so that the Navajo weaving by the women is an extraordinary thing. Women on the edge of the Paleolithic and the Neolithic are some of the greatest artists of all time. It's like all of the great Eskimo artists who made Eskimo prints. Almost all of them are women. Almost all of the Navajo weaving is done by the women. Almost all of the American genius in anthropology was done by women from 1920 to 1950. And one finds it's like a who's who. Gladys Reichardt is peculiar. She was a loner. She was a lonely spirit. And when we come back from the break, we'll see that her Quaker background from rural Pennsylvania served her well. Because one of the things, American Indians do not open up to aggression. They fight aggression. But they open up to someone who can sit quietly with them in the existential longness of life and be together. She could do that. Let's take a break. In the American Indian tradition of the Great Plains, the central ceremony is always the sun dance. In Algonquin, called the Okan. And in order for that ceremony to be staged, it has to be hosted. Only a woman, only a holy woman, can host the Sundance. If the conditions are such that, in her judgment, the tribe has gone so far out of sync 
that the world is so um, disturbed, that nature is impaired, and the experience of the people is distorted. A holy woman will take it upon herself in midwinter to make a vow to host the sun dance that summer, that coming summer. And she will take something of her clothing, like her personal shawl, her scarf. She will tie it to a carved and decorated uh, stick. And she will uh, place that so that it is exposed like a Tibetan prayer flag to the elements in midwinter. The Blackfoot uh, nation was at um, 52 degrees north, which is about the same um, latitude as Stockholm, Sweden. So the winters are very cold. It could be 40 below. The entire tribe then comports itself towards fulfilling the completeness of her vow. She makes the encircling guardianship of the entire ceremony for the entire tribe and for other tribes that can be invited. The Blackfoot Nation always had the uh, stony and the uh, blood and the pagan and sometimes the uh, Cree, sometimes even the Ojibwa, always uh, invited to participate because anyone who participates it gains the coherence of that ceremony. The Algonquin uh, Okan is uh, a long um, eight-day uh, ceremony. And in order to build that Sundance Lodge, only men who have fought in battle are chosen to go out and select the tree, which will be the Sundance Lodge center pole. And they will go out as a band of men as if going to war. And they will locate a tree, the Sundance uh, Lodge Center tree always has a huge fork in it at the top because it has to be an architectural structural unit to hold many things. They will then surround that tree and each will tell a story from his bravery. And then they will leap on that tree as if it were an enemy and cut it down and shear it. And they will bring that uh, tree uh, cut and sheared and cut off at the top uh, on some large buckboard with all the men singing war songs and bring that into the location where the Sundance Lodge is going to be erected. And in the whole erecting of the Sundance Lodge, the tree slowly becomes holy. Any enemy, any demonic, any evil that would have or could have been there has been driven out by the courage of the men but it is restored back into a sacred condition by um, the vow of the holy woman and all of the activities that go on. Everyone in the tribe, everyone participating in the sun dance will have their teepees in a great circle, but the holy woman will be in a lodge by herself outside the circle. And she busies herself while the men have been cutting the center tree and then by them gathering boughs of evergreens to make a wicket surrounding it so that the Sundance Lodge becomes like an open building. 
And anyone in the tribe, anyone invited, who has a, a need for a cure, a need for a purification, a prayer, will have those uh, prayers uh, written and affixed to long poles. And all those poles will be put into a leaning position so that the prayers are all clustered and gathered in the fork of the tree at the top. And from that fork is suspended two long leather strips, thongs, that have at the ends of them uh, two sharp bits of deer antler. And some young man of the tribe will volunteer to put those antlers into his flesh and to dance until he has pulled himself free from those uh, thongs, and he cannot cry out with a human voice. He is given an um, eagle bone whistle, which he puts in his mouth, and the only sound he can make is to blow that whistle. The shrill eagle bone sound is very eerie, especially in this um, tense, immense, silent, grunting, painful display before the entire tribe, the entire uh, ceremony. And the drummers inside of the Holy Lodge provide the only articulation of the rhythm, which is an iteration, to send this event vibratorily into the earth so that the earth will uh, understand the courage of men and will grant them the ability for existence to continue, for life to be there. But none of it would have a transform quality were it not for the holy woman and for her spirit guardianship, which encircles all of it. She, meantime, has been cutting dried buffalo tongues buffalo tongues that have been jerkied and dried out, and she cuts them into strips. And she is the one who, hosting that ceremony, gives those uh, cut, dried buffalo tongue strips to everyone in the ceremony. It's like she's uh, the female priest administering the sacrament. And um, this is part of her gathering the responsibility for nourishing the people for that event and for making a sacred enclosure whereby the transform of the ceremony goes to everyone who participates. It is distributed equally. No one gains more or less. A similar, smaller version of this is what the sand paintings are all about. The sand paintings, as we talked about, sometimes could have been for hunting efficacy, for war efficacy, sometimes for something called blessing ways, for gaining blessings, but largely the medicinal cures are of two kinds. One kind is an invitation of holiness to come in as a holy way. And there are many different versions of holy ways. The other is an evil way to ward off, to exercise, to get rid of an evil. And then there is a third kind called life ways, which is largely for people who have been injured uh, accidentally. And, and need to be uh, uh, helped and cured. But the holy ways and the evil ways have a gender inflection. They can be male or female. There can be a male evil way, a female holy way. And these uh, gender inflections are a part of the 
ritual completeness that is given a special kind of dynamic. And it works like this. Existence primordially when it comes into shape, when it comes into existentiality, its primary registry is in space. So that one could visualize that as a square. That it comes whole as that square. But in order to change, to reinstate, to purify, you can't leave it as a square the square has to be put into a dynamic and it goes from a square to a parallelogram. And in that parallelogram, what is important is the dimension of time. And time assumes then not the character of a dimension like the three dimensions of space, but it takes a different shape. It becomes like an arrow, it becomes like a vector. <laughs> And one of the great uh, discoveries by human beings tens of thousands of years ago, but not understood until just recent centuries, a vector, a parallelogram vectoring is able to be existential without boundaries. It's not dependent upon bounded coordinates for it to be real and for all of its uh, correlative correlates to be uh, true as well. So that in vector analysis and mathematics, one can use the principle of uh, vectors, of parallelograms, and develop a great deal of um, sophistication. One can even go into making a short form of the parallelogram, you can use the bottom triangle or the top triangle, and it will uh, suffice, but it doesn't have the basic cogency that the whole parallelogram has. It's the difference between a square and a diamond. It's the quality that now what transpires here is not dependent upon boundedness, or coordinates that are known, but that one can have efficacy even though uh, it's unbounded and uh, the coordinates are not known. And it is also transferable to any correlate, to any correlation. And so someone who provides, like a spirit guardian, unbounded uh, quality is able to take time and put it into a healing uh, mode so that the structures of existence now are not just there, but they are there dynamically and available as such for a quicker, deeper, truer transform. So that visionary transformation has to be prepared for by shifting so that time, instead of being static, becomes dynamic. And one of the reasons for drums is to help get that rhythm into the accrual quality where it, uh, it easier becomes dynamic. And one of the qualities in uh, the holy ways or evil ways or life ways, all those kinds of ceremonial things, ceremonies, they are, uh, to be completely efficacious, they need to be performed four times. Not just for the four directions, but also for those four dimensions. But also for the wholeness of the square and its stability, and the wholeness of the parallelogram and its dynamic, and for the way in which transform can come into play. Now, a great deal is made out of circles. But circles are like squares, and when they're put into a dynamic, they are no longer circles, they are spirals. So the parallelogram and the spiral have really uh, deep qualities, not esoteric so much, but preparatory, because it is those 
forms of existence that are easiest to accept transformation. And so there is a deep quality in ritual that if one is going to bring in a transform, that operator has to have dynamic conditions within which to work. And so the preparation for that is all about not purifying it so it's medicinally static, but purifying it so that the medicine is um, scintillating, so that it, is, uh, it has a, a charmed quality to it. And one notices this because the transform that comes in from visionary consciousness does not keep track of time. It is timeless. The standard English word that we would use, it's a moment of eternity. And so those moments of eternity, when they begin to punctuate the dynamic of scintillating time, the entire ceremony then changes. Instead of being a ceremony by ritual rote, it has prepared itself to be dynamically uh, available for transform, and when the transformation comes in, an effortlessness to the action begins to occur. One loses all sense of exhaustion or tiredness, and one floats through, flies through. One has a, a, a winged uh, quality, and uh, in fact, in Homer, the normal rhetoric of court decorum was changed to a poetic of artistic possibility, and then that poetic was given spiritual wings, and uh, Homer says that these now are winged words. And they are able to uh, not only penetrate through all of the levels of life, but all of the levels of uh, supra life as well. Not just to the gods, but beyond the gods. Homer's Olympian gods are not the final arbiters. They are actors on a stage that has no limits. And the stage that has no limits for Homer's Olympic pantheon is uh, what we would call fate, Moira, destiny, fate. Even the gods must obey that. But fate has no limitations so that only someone working with a vectored, dynamic time would be able to have efficacy of bringing moments of eternal transcendence into articulation in that dynamic and to have the efficacy of the events. All of this becomes uh, quickly deep, but it also becomes traditional so that one can understand. We began today talking about thought, word, and deed, but thoughts, symbols, words, myth, deeds, actions, ritual. And not only is it then ritual, myth, and symbol in increasing integral complexity and the ability to index completeness, for instance, in the traditional uh, Indian Ayurvedic medicine, there are likewise those three realms of thought, word, and deed. There's the physical realm of ritual existence. There is the vital realm of life experience, and then there is the uh, mental realm of symbolic thought. And so in Ayurvedic medicine, one has to coordinate those three realms together, and the coordination of the three together include then an, a core synthesizing index of a dynamic time. And while the ancient uh, Indian uh, quality was always to coordinate the physical with the vital, with the mental, 
the spiritual synthesizing core was always the, the holy wind that uh, gusted through and brought these uh, three realms not so much into stasis and not so much into a parfait, but brought them into a constellation of scintillation, the breath of life. Very similar in the Navajo is the holy wind. We'll talk more about it next week. The holy wind then begins to operate so that one's singing is no longer a language of the ritual, rote, learned chant or litany of the lungs, but now has a different quality to it. The language, like Homer's winged words, becomes uh, spiritual and begins to have this uh, quality, just like the physical action becomes effortless, the language now begins to flow in a very special way. It flows so that its resonances disappear back into the mysteriousness of nature and also disappear into uh, the transcendent qualities beyond the mind so that one has uh, eminence in mysterious nature and a transcendence in eternal consciousness the very same time. And it's like the pool of existence now has language that comes into play so that its resonances go out beyond the liminals of any conditions that would have uh, limited health or man or the spirit or life itself. And the efficacy is to bring the mysteriousness of nature and the mystery the, of the mystic uh, consciousness of vision into play so that one now is surrounded by a process that is eternally mysterious and thus unbounded so that all integral forms no longer have bounds of any kind and only with a dynamic vectored quality to time that is now permeated and articulated by intervals of eternalness within it, bringing the zeros into play into uh, the process experience, which is a third process between nature and vision, now becomes holy. It is capable of hosting a very special condition, just like nature could deliver existence complete and whole, now human experience can deliver symbols complete and whole. The symbols that come out of that perforated living experience. In ancient Egypt, uh, the phrase was used that translates as living time. And in the, in the pyramid texts of uh, 2700 BC, the very first way in which living time was always shown is that uh, the royal cobras are arranged like uh, big figure eights, but they're like figure eights that are contiguous, and so you have this accordion of figure eights going all the way through, and it's like the resonance of the eternal. It's like, yes, there is a calibration of the ogdode, but the calibration iteration of the ogdode is infinite. And so one now has living time so that life becomes life eternal. And the salvation is not the saved that something static is going to be around. It's that everything now uh, is uh, spiritually uh, dynamic. And so nature, experience, and vision, all three processes have this ability to be fertile. And like nature delivering, delivering existence, which is whole, and now experience delivering symbols which are whole, visionary consciousness delivers its form whole, and its form are art forms. And spirits are always art forms. They're always supernatural, and they're always differential. They're not inter integral forms at all. So that with the Navajo sand paintings, the whole idea is not to preserve the sand painting. The whole thrust of it is that the person needing to be cured 
will sit on the prepared sand paintings and receive the, being, the songs being sung over them, receive through some gourd the herbal uh, medicines. And when all of the uh, ceremonies are finished, all of the days and nights of the ceremonies are finished, that person, she will get up or he will get up. And with an eagle feather brush, the medicine man will brush away the last remnants of the grit, of the sand painting from the body. And that person then is restored to existential wholeness. And at the same time, they're restored so that their uh, mind is whole. And if it's uh, done completely uh, four times in this way, the completeness is available for a very special high transform so that the spirit then becomes whole in a differential way, which means eternal. So there is a, a double quality of transform. The first transform in Western uh, tradition, it's always the transformation of fermentation. But the second transform is a transform of distillation. Not just turning the water into wine, but turning the wine, distilling it into cognac. So that the spirit now is a special kind of wine. It has that uh, special scintillation to it. And because it has that special transcendent scintillation, in an eternal unboundedness, any of its vectors <laughs> will now be able to differentially generate a participation not just in nature, but a participation in the cosmos. So that one is able to be in the harmonies of the uh, infinite cosmos. So there are different uh, levels here of, of this uh, kind of concern and the basic quality is that ritual, when it begins, its traditional place is always to be like a baffle, to be a filter, to select from the natural flow and filter and make sure that one emphasizes these actions and these sequences, but also a baffle and a filter for the qualities of mind or experience that need to be purified, need to be coordinated, need to be brought back into tradition. So that unattended ritual tends to be like a filter that gets gummed up all by itself. So that there have to be special occasional times where the rituals have to be purified themselves, the filters have to be cleaned. The baffles have to be uh, redone so that they don't inadvertently, by their automatic continuance, cease to be of use, cease to be of a function. They will no longer become dynamic. <laughs> One can't make a parallelogram out of it. It's frozen into the square. It won't change. So that this requires not just a medicine man, but it requires a medicine man of medicine men. <laughs> Someone who is exponential, who isn't just a doctor, but is a doctor of doctors. Not just a teacher, but a teacher of teachers. Not just a king, but a king of kings. These are the kinds of phrases that one hears. In this, the difficulty is that all of the dynamic is now seen as a jeopardy to the existing static ritual comportment. We don't want change. We have these rituals because they shouldn't be changed. And if they're changed, it has to be a very special event. And you're changing people to reintroduce them back into tradition so that they're safe again. And we don't know about people who are changing ritual <laughs> so that the entire comportment now is going to be uh, thrown into the unknown. And so the difficulty is, is that uh, ritual baffles, ritual filters, 
have especially a susceptibility to time limitations. They only last so long. You can purify someone several times in their life, but it might be a hundred lives before the ritual filter frame itself has to be purified. And this is always a deep crisis because time itself in its traditional form is now what has to be uh, thrown into boundlessness, into the parallelogram, into the vectoring. And so instead of having stability, one has only instability. And not to quickly get to another stability, but to remain unstable in the sense of boundlessness, unboundedness. And the only way that this is tolerable at all is that someone needs, like a holy woman, to sponsor the guardianship of that entire event to take place because everyone else is going to be uncoordinated. They will have no ordination whatsoever. They have no sense of space, no sense of time, no sense of tradition, no sense of trust on any level whatsoever. And so, like uh, in uh, the Sufi uh, 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 phrase, this uh, zikr is uh, um, something not only mysterious and mystic, but also uh, frightening because one doesn't know. And it's precisely because one cannot know. And yet, if the traditional wisdom is presented in the right way, not in one tradition so that one understands that's our tradition and that's the wisdom, because it's the very tradition that's going to be called into erasure. So the time honored development was to take a comparative of many traditions together so that one understands it isn't that our tradition is going to be completely erased, it's that all of these traditions in their own ways are going to be completely erased so that there is a, a, a more of a sense of toleration, if you can use that word, because comparative uh, uh, cultures like this give one a better sense of letting it be. One of the startling developments in world history was the United States of the uh, late 19th and early 20th century because for the very first time with the science of anthropology coming into play, and the first book in anthropology by E.B. Tyler was uh, written in the 1860s. It was very, very recent. And only by the 1880s did it begin to get a real purchase, and its real purchase, as we talked about, was in the Western United States, opened up for the first time by railroads so that hundreds of thousands of people were going to come into what essentially was a wilderness. Had never had many people at all. The tribe I was closest to, the Blackfoot, it never had more than 2,300 men at any time in their history. So with the men and the women and the children and some older people, you had a population of people that was uh, under 10,000 people running an area of prairie larger than France. But 10,000 people are nothing when railroads are bringing hundreds of thousands and millions of people in. And so in the 1880s, it was the uh, first decade of crisis. And as all of these uh, developments of rushing to get these ethnological reports, to get people out in the field to understand, all of a sudden, instead of just the American government sponsoring this, the Bureau of uh, Indian Affairs, uh, you had things like this, Memoirs of the American Museum of Natural History, May 1902. The Hyde Southwestern Expedition, the Night Chant, a Navajo Ceremony. And here in 1887, the uh, fifth annual report, its big paper in here is also a 
by the same man, uh, Washington uh, Matthews, on the night chant. And one finds in here, for the very first time, this is the mountain chant, a Navajo ceremony by Dr. Washington Matthews. And he talks about the mountain chant in 1887, the night chant in 1902. But in 1887 is the first time that anyone ever made Navajo sand paintings in a permanent form. Because they were not for the tribe in its tradition, they were to educate a population of Americans for the first time of what this was all about. And so in 1887, for the very first time, a watershed, a spiritual form, never before recorded, ever, was recorded for the first time. And as these, uh, there were four in 1887, and as these uh, took place and happened and these various ceremonies were indexed, all of a sudden, the field opened up by a number of geniuses. And I, as I said, the first wave were men, and the second wave were women. And the second wave was about three times the size of the first wave. You had a couple of geniuses like Alfred Kroeber, or Robert Lowy, or Pliny Goddard. And then all of a sudden, the second wave, you had about a dozen of the greatest anthropologists of all time. Maybe 10 or 11 out of the 12 were all women. They all knew each other, and they all went out into the fields with the American Indians, especially in various tribes. And the star of that was always held to be Ruth Benedict, the big name at uh, Columbia, and her patterns of culture is something which is a classic book. But the hidden sleeper genius is Gladys Reichardt, and her work on the Navajo sand paintings is one of the most subtle triumphs in world history. And she spent all of World War II expanding it, expanding it. And in 1950, the Bollingen uh, series uh, published her great uh, two-volume book on Navajo religion, more than 800 pages. And when standard anthropologists like Ruth Benedict or Clyde Colicon, the Harvard people, read it, they said it's just full of uh, amazing, subtle uh, insights, but it doesn't have any theory. It doesn't have any structure. It doesn't have any form. Because they were unable to understand that she was doing a real spirit operator transform on vectors and not just fortifying some symbolic system. So I've chosen uh, Gladys Reichardt, and we'll come back to her next week. She got it from her old Quaker father growing up in Pennsylvania, how to sit quietly and do nothing and get everything done. <laughs>